So grateful that you're willing to stretch your music talents and abilities and sing some things uh, that truly are praise and worship of the Lord. Brother Brian, could you turn that air on just for us to circulate some of this hot air uh, that I'm about to put out? Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1. I know it's warm when people come in and say, man, I don't ever take my coat off in church and I am doing that today. Uh, I said, that's because I didn't have control of the thermostat this morning, but we'll get adjusted here. First Peter chapter one, and you say, well, why do you want it a little bit cool? Because I don't want you to fall asleep, all right? I want you to catch the things that God has intended for you to hear today. Uh, I believe that it's not a mistake that you are here, uh, but something that God has uh, led and God has designed, and I'm grateful that you have Uh, listened and obeyed and followed through uh, with that, and I'm sure it has nothing to do with the pizza afterwards, all right? First Peter chapter 1, and some of you are going, no, it didn't, because I didn't even know we got pizza coming. Uh, Yeah, it's a surprise for those of you that didn't know, and for those that you did, well, that's probably why you're here. But first Peter chapter 1 in verse, uh, uh, well, let's see here. We're going to start... I don't even know where to start. I'll start at the beginning, you know. No, let's go down to verse 13. We'll start there. 1 Peter chapter 1 and uh, verse 13. And you say, why do you not know where to start? Well, because uh, this message that I originally preached has turned into three. So uh, I'm trying to uh, carry on without re-preaching and preaching what God has for us. But here's what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus. Now, we're talking about here the battle of sanctification. And and that battle of sanctification, uh, it provides us with uh, some aspects in regards to uh, the different uh, realms that we battle within. And this first verse here in verse 13 helps us to understand the battle of the thoughts. The battle of the thoughts, or we could say the battle of the mind, the things that are going on in our head. And you know as well as I know that there are so many times, so many thoughts that are swirling around in our minds. It's sometimes uh, difficult to really decipher through those things and, and, and make sure that we're understanding which one should be there and which one should be cast out. But that verse 13 gave us a few things to help us in that. And that's the first thought was to be free and that's girding up the loins of our mind. The second was to be focused or being sober. And then that third thought was to be founded in faith of a real future, which is that word hope that we have unto the end. And that helps us in that battle of the thoughts and being sanctified in our minds. But then we looked at last week, the battle of the desires. The battle of desires, that's found there in verse 14. It says this, as obedient children not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. Now, if you didn't hear that message, I certainly would encourage you to go back and find it uh, there on our YouTube. Uh, is that called a channel? YouTube channel, all right? Uh, whatever. Uh, and, and find that. Listen to that. It was uh, certainly, I think, is something that will help you with the, the battle of the desires. We all have uh, that battle that goes on. I desire to do this, but I know God wants me to do this. And I want to get to the point where not only am I doing what God wants me to do, but I'm desiring to do what God wants me to do because then that doesn't uh, uh, change and it keeps me on that right path. And and in doing so, we find that there was a need for obedience. There was a need for objecting. And then there was a need for observing, observing what I want, observing when it presents itself, but observing the way of escape. Now let's look here at verse 15 Uh, Again, as we continue in this thought of the battle uh, uh, for sanctification, we're going to look at the battle of duty. The battle of duty. We have the battle of thoughts, the battle of desire, but the battle of duty. Here's what he says in verse 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And read verse 16 with me. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. 
Now, this aspect of holiness is uh, uh, certainly something that uh, we've heard the word multiple times used, and we probably have heard it in, 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 in contexts that maybe weren't um, uh, spun in a way that said, this is a good thing. Uh, a lot of times when we hear the word holiness, it almost becomes something that we turn our nose up at because we're afraid of what it's going to do to our lives. But I want you to lay aside for me just for uh, this, uh, you know, four hours that I preach. I want you to lay aside for me any preconceived notions that you may have regarding holiness. And I want you to just allow the Lord to teach you this morning what is holiness and how it needs to be a part of our lives. This The, the word there in uh, uh, the scriptures means a sacred, sacred. It gives us an idea of physically pure, morally blameless, or religiously consecrated. Physically pure, morally blameless, or religiously consecrated. That's what we're talking about here when we're talking about this aspect of being holy. Uh, when we when we pull up the, the definition in the Webster's Dictionary. It gives us a, a little more insight here. It says properly, whole. You can get the idea of holy, uh, uh, W-H, and holy, H-O, right? Uh, those two uh, spellings of the word that uh, pronounce uh, very similar. Entire or perfect. Entire or perfect. So when we're saying this aspect of being holy, we recognize the purity involved with it, but then the, the, the aspect of it's all-encompassing in a moral sense, all right? So hence, it's pure in heart, temper, or dispositions. Pure in heart, temper, or dispositions. Now I can say having an ungodly temper is not holy. Okay, so we're not talking about getting angry, being holy. Uh, we're talking about the, the, the mentality that we have, our temperament, that it would be pure. Uh, it's free from sin and sinful affections. Obviously, we know that when it's applied to the supreme being, God himself, holy, signifies perfectly pure, immaculate, and complete in moral character. Now you realize that's our God. He is holy. We're going to look at that here in just a minute. But when we talk about it as far as uh, people, all right, uh, us as mankind, uh, we see that it's still this idea of holiness, but it's, it's more or less holy, right? Because None of us are perfect, and I think that's the main argument that I receive whenever we're talking about being holy. Well, Pastor, I will never be able to be perfect. And what they're really saying in, in saying that, or what we say when we say that is, I'm giving you excuse for my sin. So I'm going to do what I'm going to do because, you know what, I can never be perfect. But I want you to think about this. In man, it's more or less holy, as his heart is more or less sanctified, or purified from evil dispositions. In fact, we call a man holy when his heart is conformed in some degree to the image of God and his life is regulated by the divine precepts. Hence, holy is used as nearly synonymous with good, pious, or godly. Now, I don't want the definition to take away from the holiness that God desires because he certainly shows us the standard. We're going to look at that here in just a minute. But when we, when we think about this mindset here, we think about we want to be striving for perfection, striving for absolute holiness. And when you strive for that, the closer you get to it, the more you have of it in your life. Now we can take the other mindset and we can say, you know what, I'll never get there, so therefore let me never try. And if I, if I take that mindset, then what happens in my life? You know, you never stand in the same place. You either move towards God or you move away from God. And so if I come down that path and I say, this is not possible, you know what, I'm just going to deal with what I can deal with and do what I can do, you will find yourself on a slide heading away from that mark of pure holiness. 
may we never be in that position. So this battle of duty, you know, I believe that God is concerned about what you and I do on a daily basis. I believe he's concerned about the the decisions that we make in this life. He's concerned about the thoughts that we think, certainly. He's concerned about the desires we have, but he's also concerned about the everyday actions that we partake in. And so don't think that God just stands up there and says, you know what, I've saved you, everything's wonderful, now go live any way you like to, and when you get to heaven, we'll figure it all out. That is a, that is, that is a lie straight from the pits of hell. Don't buy into it. Instead, bind this fact of the scriptures that says, Be holy, for I am holy. So let's look at this first aspect, the provision of holiness. The provision of holiness. As we see here in verse 15, the Bible says in that very first statement, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And verse 16 also emphasizes it as well. Because it is written, be ye holy for, what's the next word? I. I. Now who is I? It's not pastor. And it's not you. It is God. Because God is holy. So we, we got we to gotta think about the provision of holiness that we have. First of all, the standard of holiness. Who is the standard of holiness? God himself. In fact, Matthew chapter 5 verse 48 says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven, excuse me, is perfect. Even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. You know, again, in our rationale of, of our mindset, sometimes we try to figure these things out in an improper manner. Take the Bible at what it says. If God says be perfect as He is perfect, then we recognize the standard of perfection that He has and we strive for that standard. I want you to take your Bibles and turn over to Revelation chapter 4. You want to keep your finger there in First Peter. We'll come back to that. But Revelation chapter 4, you know, there's, a, there's plenty of places in Scripture that really uh, help us to understand and depict the, the holiness of God. Uh, but I think this is certainly one of the ones that is, is probably the most vivid uh, because we get a little glimpse into what John saw in heaven, right? And uh, in heaven, there's some amazing sights that we, we, listen, we will behold. We will get to see them. And I think this is one of them that we will see. But look at verse 8 of Revelation chapter 4. It says, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Now, how often do they proclaim that? It's kind of a consistent thing, isn't it? Doesn't it say there that they rest not day and night? I mean, this is just, they're right before the throne of God and they're constantly just saying this over and over again. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. In verse 9, it says, And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created and in this vision of of heaven and the things that John sees that he he describes for us we recognize one of the things that becomes so evident is the holiness of our God the light that enthroned that circles the throne of our God the the purity that flows from him the fact that there is no sin no evil uh, nothing wrong or wrongdoing in our God 
is our God. It's hard to even fathom completely and wholly just how righteous God is. But he truly is completely without sin. You search for any kind of impurity, you will not find it in God. That's how holy God is. He's completely holy in every conclusion that he has ever made. He's completely holy in every action that he's ever partake of or done. He's completely holy in all manners of his being and his doing. That's an amazing God that we have that we can consider in uh, and through uh, these things. In fact, we, we take that standard a little bit farther and we see the scope of holiness, the scope of holiness. Uh, look over to Leviticus chapter 11. In verse 44, Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 44. And, you know, I, I feel really, uh, I guess I could say, um, insufficient in describing the holiness of God. Something that I, I read and I, I state from the standpoint of the fact of Scripture. But, man, I tell you, this takes more than just statement. This takes some true consideration and meditation and dwelling on how pure our God is. It's amazing. It's amazing to consider His holiness. And, and you know what happens when you truly consider His holiness? We take this, the, this, the aspect of so many of the, of the prophets, the vessels before us that fall on their face recognizing just how unholy we are as people. Stop comparing yourself to the standard of someone else. You and I can always find somebody who is worse off in this life than we are. We can always find somebody whose mouth is more vile than ours. We can always find someone who, whose uh, uh, actions are more vile than anything that we would ever do. And when we compare ourselves to that standard of holiness, man, we're looking pretty good. In fact, our report card is coming out better than anything we got in grade school or high school or anything else, right? Because, boy, there's straight A's there compared to you. But take it at the Scripture statement here and make the standard God and strive for that kind of holiness. The scope here, Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. Uh, the, the scripture there in Peter specifically said, because it is written. Uh, in other words, that is re referencing back to somewhere else where we find it in the scriptures. And we find that in Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 44. And here's what it says. For I am the Lord your God. Today is he your God? Is he your Lord and your God? Is he the one that's the supreme being that rules over your life? Are you fully submitted and surrendered to him and his will for your life? If that's the case, he is your Lord, he is your God. And this is what it says, Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves. The scope of holiness includes this aspect of sanctification. It includes me getting rid of the impurities within the things that, that, that maybe the old flesh is hung on to, the, maybe it's a, a thought or some kind of a principle that I have stated and, 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 and tried to make the truth, and I know it's not the truth, and yet, I, you know, kind of that idea, and here's one of them that's very easy, uh, a little sin is okay. You know, we're not going to live to this to, you know, we're, we're not going to go all the way to that point in, in that life what that person says about things. You know, we're going to just, we're going to be content or I'm going to be content to have just a little bit of this stuff that maybe some people would say is sin or some people would say is wrong. Now, again, does it matter what some people would say? What matters is what God would say. And this aspect of me in the scope of my holiness is me being willing to say, here's what the scripture says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. 
So if I have just a little bit of this sin in my life, that should not be acceptable. And so what I want to happen, I want God to reveal that to me so that I can sanctify myself, so that I can go to Him, seek His forgiveness for it, put it off, as the Scripture says, and instead put on the things that the Lord would have for me to do. And, and this is one of those things that, listen, no matter where you are in life, there is something that you can understand and take part of in this particular principle. You may be a very uh, solid, righteous, God-fearing, God-loving individual, and you're still going to have some of those things in there that you can say, hey, Lord, this is not right. In fact, I can, I can tell you this, the closer you get to God, the brighter the light shines, the more things you can see. You know, it's kind of like if you turn the lights off and walk in the bathroom, it doesn't look so bad. But then when the light goes on, you know, and maybe you have different types of lighting in different bathrooms or something in the mirrors, you know. If you got just a low dim light and you look in the mirror, it still doesn't look real bad. <laughs> Some of you are going, uh, you're not looking at what we're looking at then, you know. But if I go in the bathroom and I turn all the lights on, and man, the brightness is there, guess what? It's going to show me everything that's right there. And that's when I go, ha! Ah! <laughs> Do something about that, you know. That's the way it is with God. I get closer to his word. Don't be surprised when you see things that you didn't see before. You know, God's revealed to me things that I thought I could do, things that I thought was okay, thought, thought that it was according to his will. As I got closer to him, he said, now, by the way, hey, you know that? No, no more. Huh? Are you serious, Lord? That wasn't, oh, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. You know what that does too, and, 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 and maybe I'm, you know, chasing a little bit of a rabbit here. I'll try to get back in just a second, but that also helps us with the holier-than-thou mentality. You know, one of the things or one of the realities that we face in this aspect of holiness, and I probably have this in my notes somewhere. I'm going to have to get back to that, but... If you strive to be holy according to the scriptures, be ready for the accusations. Be ready for the, I want to say persecution, although that probably is a little bit of a strong term. But be ready for people not to like that. Now, don't give them any fuel for their fire in this realm of being holier than thou. Because the way that we battle against the being holier than thou <clears throat> is the principle of the speck and the beam. What did the Lord say? Be careful about trying to take the speck out of your brother's eye when there's a beam in your own eye. If we constantly strive to allow the Lord to cleanse us and to sanctify us, that will keep us in a humble position before Him and before others. And the holiness that He does develop in our life will not be about how good I am. It'll be about what else does He want to take out of me? What else does He want to bring within me? What work does He want to do? And that then defeats the whole pride and self-centered mindset of, Ooh, I can walk around a little bit taller today because you know what? I put off such and such sin in my life. And so I'm not like Michael anymore. I'm better than him. Don't tell him that, and I don't want to make anybody, I don't want to say that out loud because that might be thought of as pride. Oh, imagine that. It is pride, right? But this scope just shows us how there's a need to sanctify yourself. And then, what does it say? The rather part of that, or middle part of that verse, it says, and ye shall be holy. When we sanctify ourselves and we see God working to remove those impurities and we see Him replacing that with His righteousness, the natural occurrence becomes holiness. And so though this is a command, this is a work that God does within us. 
That's what's so wonderful about looking at the scope of it. It sanctify yourself, but then that's when the Lord says, okay, now that I've forgiven you, I've cleansed you, and I've provided you with true righteousness, now you can be holy. And he says, why? For I am holy. Then he moves on to the practical aspects, neither defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and he gets on into some of the, the commands of the law. Uh, but, you know, when we see this aspect of sanctification, we see this aspect of, the, uh, of God uh, uh, desiring us to uh, allow him to do that work in our life, uh, this also, this provision of holiness includes the sacrifice for holiness, the sacrifice for holiness. I cannot mention this, uh, uh, this area of life. I cannot mention this battle of duty, including this concept of being holy, without speaking to the regards of the salvation that we are provided through Jesus Christ. You know, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Remission of sin, the forgiveness of sin, is what we need in order to be sanctified, in order to be uh, set apart, in order to experience this holiness. Now, go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, and, and I'm probably jumping ahead a little bit because I'll, I'll be getting to this eventually, uh, as long as I don't take you know one week per verse, if I can speed up just a little bit. But look at verse 18 here. It says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. And notice this, from your vain conversation. Now, what did we see down in verse 15? We saw in all, uh, so be holy in all manner of conversation. The vain conversation is the empty conversation. It's the sinful conversation. It's the conversation that you received by tradition from your fathers. There was nothing that could buy you out of that. There was nothing that could cleanse you from it. You couldn't find enough gold. You couldn't find enough silver. You couldn't find enough resources to pay for your redemption, to pay for the cleansing of our sin. But instead, in verse 19, it says, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish, and without spot. There's the holiness that's come in, right? Because the lamb had to be perfect. Our sacrifice, our Savior had to be perfect. He had to be without sin. He had to be holy. In order for us then to have the hope of having holiness in our life. Today, listen, this message has really uh, no command for you to be holy until... You have been saved the Bible way. Until you've repented of your sin and trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, as the sacrifice that He became to pay the price of your redemption, of the forgiveness of your sin. Now we move forward into this Amos 3 3. It says, Can two walk together except they be degreed? You see, I want to have fellowship with my Savior who sacrificed for me. How do I have fellowship? Only way I can have fellowship if we agree. Now let me tell you something. He's not going to change his mind to agree with your sin. In order for us to agree with him and to walk with him, we have to come to the terms that he's already set because he is perfect, he is holy, and we can walk together with him when we are striving for that holiness. Well, let's move out of the provision of holiness. Let's move into the practice of holiness. The practice of holiness, the first thing I see here is that, that it must permeate all areas of my life. It must permeate all areas of my life. Uh, as he said there in verse 15, uh, so be holy in all manner of conversation. Now, if we take the word conversation and we use it in the term or in the definition that we utilize today for it, we would say, well, you know what? As long as my language or the words that I speak are holy, then I'm doing well, right? doesn't matter who I'm talking to. It doesn't matter who I'm talking with. It uh, doesn't matter the instance or the case. As long as my words are holy, I'm doing well. But that word conversation actually means lifestyle. 
lifestyle. It's in all manner of my lifestyle. Now, I want you to think about this again, right? Because we, we tend to think in, in boxes or we tend to divide our life up into sections, into areas, and we say, okay, you know what? Uh, the Lord has saved me. And uh, he desires me to be righteous. He desires me to do right. So you know what? In this particular area of my life, I will agree to do that. But Lord, stay away from this area. Because this is hands off. This is for me. This is what I am going to do. I enjoy this aspect of life and I'm going to partake of it. And Lord, I just, you know what? But I still, I promise you, I will be holy in this area. I'll be holy on Sunday mornings when I come to church. But don't ask me about Friday nights or Saturday nights. Those are my times. Those are when I can do what I want to do. And you don't really, don't worry about it, God. It'll all work out, right? That's not what God says. It says it must permeate all areas of my life. So now I've got to think about this. There's not a time in any part of the day or the week or the month or the year that I get get out of holiness free card. Today is my unholy day. You know, like some of those diets, the, the ones that, you know, we really kind of hold on to and enjoy, they have what they call that cheat day. Um, somebody told me the other day, I think Ben, you were telling me, uh, one of his uh, uh, buddies had a cheat day on his diet. Now, if you saw this guy, you'd say, do you really ever cheat? But anyways, uh, he had a cheat day. And on his cheat day, he went to Krispy Kreme and ate a dozen donuts. <laughs> wow. You talk about an unholy cheat day. There it is. I get... Now, the rest of the time, it's a broccoli and asparagus and everything else. So, you know, you and I are not willing to pay the price to go eat the dozen of donuts <laughs> the once a, a month or a week that, we, that he gets that, right? But here, when you think about it now, listen. There is no cheat day on God and holiness. There is no sectioning of my life, partitioning off certain areas to say, God, you stay out of, because I can tell you what God is going to do. I've seen him do it in my life. I've seen him do it in the lives of many other people. He'll have one long, con constant statement in your life, and it'll keep going right there, right there, right there, right there, right there. And you say, but God, look what I'm doing. Right there, right there, right? Because when we section it off, God says, no, 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 that's not okay with me. I want your whole heart. I want your whole being. I want you to be holy, holy. <laughs> Got it? So when we consider all manner of conversation, every attitude that I have in every instance ought to be holy. That's not easy. We all tend to end up with some kind of bad attitude at some point. That's not holiness. All action that I do with my hands and feet and my body, every action should be holy. Every attribute that I hold on to and claim should be holy. There is not one thing in my life that I should not desire holiness to permeate it. I mean, folks, again, you're going to have to fill in the information into your life because we don't have time just to say one by one, come on up here, confess what it is, we'll deal with your sin, then the next person, next person. You need to let the Holy Spirit deal with your heart right now. Whatever he's saying, whatever he's pointing to, does holiness permeate that, that, that area? Your, your, for instance, let's, let's take uh, the, the, the media, the entertainment area. Does holiness permeate your entertainment? You know why? Because sometimes we look at that and we say, but Lord, this is for my enjoyment. And so it's for my enjoyment, then I should be able to do what, <clears throat> what is pleasing to me. So if I want to make you know, watch this certain movie or play these certain games or if I want to, you know, spend time in, in La La Land for whatever time frame it is, then I should be able to do that. You know, God, I, I deserve that. I've, I've worked my way towards that and, and this is something that's needed for me. No, 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 no. That's a while of the devil, a snare, a trap that he's getting me into. 
And I can tell you one thing, entertainment always wants a little bit more of you. Or maybe I should say you always want a little bit more of it. But if we allow God, Lord, here's my area of my life that I dubbed entertainment. And I desire holiness in that. First of all, will you sanctify me in it? If there's things there that shouldn't be there, then you help me to get rid of them. And then place within that area, that realm of my life, what pleases you. Can I tell you something? God wants you to enjoy life. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to be joyful. He wants us to be fulfilled. And so God's not going to go, you know what? The, the whole idea of entertainment, you know what? Forget it. I want you to suffer in agony every moment of this life so that you become spiritual. No, that is the whole monk thing that, you know, we, we, we whip ourselves so that we get all the sin out of our life. Can I tell you, as much physical pain as you do to your body, you'll never get the sin out of your life. It doesn't work. It's holiness only comes through God. So it must permeate all, my, all areas of my life. Now, it, the practice of holiness, though, is it, 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 it centers around purity in my heart. It centers around purity in my heart. And again, this is probably one of those things where people start to get a little bit out of balance and they get a little uh, uh, self-righteous by focusing on the outside, by focusing on what you see and what you understand from my life. But here's the problem. You can't see inside of my heart. But my heart is where it needs to be holy. My heart is where it needs to originate. It's the area that God has saved me, the area that God is working within me. It's the place where the Spirit of God dwells inside. And when that takes place and when that occurs now, look, I, I've got this holiness that can resonate into all the areas of my life because it's purity within and it comes out. So don't take this message and say, okay, now I've got to fix everything on the outside. No, you take this message and you say, Lord, fix me on the inside so that it then comes out as a natural effect or a natural result of what you've done within my heart. That purity of heart requires us to be saved and then it requires us uh, to uh, allow the work of sanctification to take place uh, with inside. But then let's go over to the book of James, James chapter 4. In verse 7, and, and if I don't hurry, and I know sometimes I speak a little fast, but if I don't hurry, we're not going to have enough time. And I can't take one verse and make it another sermon, all right? Uh, James 4, look at verse 7. Here's, here's the, again, as we talk about the practice of holiness, here's some practical steps that you can take on a moment or daily basis that will help you to be holy because God is holy. Verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. That's the first idea. You submit yourself to God. He's the creator. He's the Lord of your life, right? That's what it said there in, in Leviticus chapter 11. If you don't acknowledge that, then you're not going to acknowledge the standard that he has created for you. If you don't acknowledge that God is in control of your life, then you set yourself up to make your own decisions regarding what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And that's where we get into problems with this idea of holiness. Listen, God is holy. He's established a standard of holiness and you and I must submit to that standard. And let me tell you something. If you don't like it, lump it. <laughs> I know that's not very loving and we're trying to be loving today, but that's where we really have to acknowledge here today. I don't necessarily like it either when I've got to tell my flesh no, but I know it's what's best for me because that's what God has established. So we submit ourselves therefore unto God and then what is it? We resist the devil. Instead of giving in to him, you tell him no. You tell him to get lost. And if you want to say it in the name of Jesus, then say it in the name of Jesus. Because that's the power that we have over uh, the enemy. Resist the devil. He is uh, certainly sworn to your destruction. He's sworn to inflict within you sin and things that will tear your life apart, break your relationships up, and destroy anything that God is trying to build within you. Then verse 8, when we resist the devil, we draw nigh to God. We grow closer to him. How do we grow closer to him? We get more into his word. We talk often with him. We converse with him. We, we just uh, have that, that open uh, communication with God and drawing nigh to him. And what happens when we draw nigh to him? He draws nigh to us. And so we become closer. When I get closer to God, I get closer to the standard of holiness. When I get closer to the standard of holiness, I have more of opportunity for it to be imparted into my life. This is just practical steps of being able to see the holiness come 
into or become a reality in my life. So I draw nigh to God, he draws nigh to me, then cleanse my hands, purify my heart. Go to God with anything that he's revealed to you that is wrong in your life and seek his forgiveness. Confess it. Speak it to him. Share it with him. Then be afflicted and mourn. You know, allow yourself to be humbled before him so that in turn he can raise you up in holiness in all manner of conversation. The last thing I want to give you is the purpose of holiness. The purpose of holiness. I cannot leave off this message without telling you why. Why? Why is it important for me to be holy? Well, first of all, it glorifies God. And you almost could just end right there, right? And you say, okay, that's fine, let's do it. No. Glorify the Lord. If God has said it and we obey it, then that pleases Him. Glorify God. He wants us to be vessels purified and meet for His use. Right? (coughs) He wants us to be... uh, that kind of individual that's so concerned about what he thinks and what he wants that we are willing to lay aside what I want in order to impart what he wants into my life. That's holiness. That pleases and glorifies the Lord. But also, the purpose of holiness is to encourage the saved. To encourage the saved. As we see Peter talking to this this group of believers who's been scattered and, and they're persecuted and they're going through all sorts of trials. Now he's encouraging them, listen, don't fall away. Don't get into sin. Don't, don't, don't get discouraged to these things. But rather, listen, you be holy. Just like God is holy. And what is that going to do? That's going to encourage each other to continue to strive to be what God wants you to be. Now, some of that encouragement becomes a little bit of reproof. Have you ever looked at somebody and saw, man, they're doing that Oof, I really wish I could do that. I really wish I should be doing that. And they've almost become a little point of conviction for you, right? Because you're seeing in their life a standard of holiness, a standard of godliness there. And, and you're saying, oh, and the Lord's using that to work within your heart. Then it's also an encouragement. You ever felt like you're the only one living righteously? Ah, oh, I'm the only one that's not going to this party. I'm the only one that's not willing to do that. I'm the only one that's going to church all this to all these hours and times. I'm the only one that's trying to be. No, be it for one another to encourage each other. And then the last purpose that I have written down here is to bring the lost to Christ. Bring the lost to Christ. One, one instance or one example we have just from right here where you are, chapter 3 and verse 1. And, and And I know this is a specific instance, and we'll probably look at it a little bit later. Um, But look what it says here, verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 3. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Notice what it says, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, what does that mean? We just said, be holy in all manner of conversation. All manner of lifestyle, right? So what is Peter encouraging here? Look, you've got a, you've got a husband who is not doing what he's supposed to be doing. That's, that's fairly common, by the way, all right? Just, <laughs> not that we need to dwell on that, but... You've got a husband who's being disobedient to the Word. Maybe he's lost. Maybe he doesn't even want to hear the, the message of salvation. Maybe he doesn't even want to hear anything about God. You have an opportunity to affect his heart through your holy lifestyle. It's amazing what God put together here in this. You may be able to win him. And in fact, I think it might even be able to go, uh, not necessarily from lost to saved, but maybe just from, you know, rebellious to obedient. But look at verse 2. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Chaste conversation, pure lifestyle. When they see that, What happens? It affects my heart. Why is it necessary for us to live a holy lifestyle in an unholy world? Because we are to shine forth the light of Jesus Christ. Light is reflected through holiness. May the Lord use us to be able to affect or to bring the lost to Christ through a willingness to live a life pleasing to Him. Now, I know sometimes that seems a little counterintuitive because a lot of times lost people like to make fun 
of those that are living holy. I dealt with that just recently. Uh, we have a, a little league uh, there in Brunswick, and and uh, been helping coach and doing some stuff with the with the boys on the team. And and then the the man that was managing the team, he he was moving on to the next level with his son, and so that position of management was uh, managing the team was there available and so there was several people wanted me to submit for that and I did and they overlooked it and they brought in somebody else that wasn't even on the team at all and placed him in that position I thought you know okay Lord I, you're, you know what you're doing it's your will your, your will be done but I was talking with one of the, the team dads and his son uh, just the other night and um, we were just kind of talking through a little bit of the situation. And, and the dad made a comment. He said, I believe you got overlooked. And, and this wasn't his exact words, but something to this effect. I believe you got overlooked and passed over because of your being a Christian. Because of essentially making a godly stance. Uh, and whatever, church attendance or conversation, things of that sort. And, and I thought that was very insightful, but then the 11, 12-year-old boy, I think he's going to be 12, he, he, he piped up too, and he said, yeah, because when those guys, he was talking about the ones that run the league and make the decisions, he says, when, when I was on the all-star team with them, they were coming in the dugout saying, hey, if you see any hot moms, I want you to let us know so we can wink at them and, and look. And then they talk about drinking, they talk about all these things. He says, I know why you didn't get chosen. Because you won't talk about that kind of stuff with them. Or, you know, you'll make them feel bad. Because they are talking about that kind of stuff. You know, it's sad that it comes to something like that. And something is like a little egg. But that's the world that we live in. Does it pull us away and say, oh, I've got to be, I've got to make them feel comfortable where they are so I can be, share Christ with them? No. It makes us to go forward being holy like God is holy so they see the standard of righteousness and how they don't add up to it and how they need a savior to save them and redeem them from that sin. Let's bow our heads. Father, as we come before you this morning, Lord, certainly a challenging message for every one of us, myself included. <clears throat> I believe this is your will, your desire, your command for each and every one of us. Father, would we truly consider these things here this morning so that you can truly have full freedom within our hearts and within our lives. If there's someone here that is not saved, Father, would you direct their hearts to Jesus Christ, the sacrifice that he made so that they could be forgiven, their sins could be paid for, and they could be made righteous. Lord, be with us in this invitation. Guide our thoughts, guide our our hearts in it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's